Great. Hello, everybody. This is Debbie McCready from Progress Software, and I'm your host for today's call, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. It's Best Practices in Cloud Deployment with Robert Mawald of IDC and Mike Armourard of Progress Software. I think we're ready to get started, so I'd like to hand over to our first speaker, Mike Ormerod. Mike, welcome. Hi, Deb. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, as Deb says, my name is Mike Ormerod. Uh, I'm an architect here at Progress Software and basically responsible for our cloud strategy. And so I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar, Best Practice in Cloud Deployment. It also gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Robert Mawold from uh, IDC. Uh, Robert is a research vice president at IDC and leads the SaaS and cloud services practice, as well as co-leads IDC's cloud services global overview program. Uh, in his role, Robert advises uh, clients on key trends and opportunities in the changing world of software creation and delivery. His research identifies trends and market dynamics in software development, licensing, and delivery characteristics of the SaaS delivery model, and provides a unique pan-software market view with both demand and supply-side insight, building go-to-market and management strategies for SaaS and traditional IT vendors. And so at this point, with that, I'd like to hand it over to Robert for our main presentation today, Best Practice in Cloud Deployment. Over to you, Robert. Great. Thanks, Mike. And um, thanks to you, Deb, for the, for the introduction. Um, and thank you all for taking the time to, to be on the line today. I know it's, uh, it's a big chunk of your day, and I, my only goal is to, uh, is to, to hopefully that we, at the end of this we learn something and uh, we're smarter for having attended at the webinar. So uh, my, my contact details are at the end, and, and Mike set aside some time for questions. Um, so I hope we'll, we'll, uh, we'll all come out a little bit smarter. Um, I want to do two things with this webinar. Uh, I, want to, I want to convey that cloud is a serious part of our IT industry, not, not, not sort of a, a fly-by-night um, um, sort, of, sort, of, sort of temporary fad, and that it's, it's playing a big role in shaping the IT sort, sourcing de de, um, decisions uh, by most organizations, by our organizations. And I also want to convey that there are best practices. Um, um, you know, mistakes have been made, uh, money's been wasted, so it's worth spending some time on understanding where cloud comes from, where we think it's going to lead us as, as an industry, uh, and both customers and vendors in the next uh, 10, 15 years, and, um, and maybe understanding a little bit about, uh, specifically, we wanted to talk a little bit about how companies can think about deploying in the cloud and, and moving some of their, their IT assets to the cloud. So hopefully that will be what we accomplish at the end of the day. If we take a look at, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is, I hope you can all see the slide here. It's a, it was a sad day taken at a borders near my house in, in uh, central Massachusetts, uh, stores closing. And, but, but I think it, we can all pretty much understand some of the factors that, that play a role here in, in why this is happening. Critical pieces that uh, the border is sold and that you know, many other retail businesses sold, like books and music and movies, um, were being digitized and, uh, and, and sold via marketplaces. Um, Amazon sort of chief among them, but we can all think of many other ones. And so the, the, the need for borders is an intermediary. Uh, to, to distribute and, and play that local role, uh, no longer quite so critical and uh, hard to compete on price. I mean, I think that that that, that statement can be uh, can be made also of a whole broad swath of the software industry uh, that is struggling to sort of compete on price and to uh, quickly distribute its new products, quickly um, refine its its products in ways that you know, the customers want, take it in directions customers are asking for. And so that's one of the sort of foundational drivers for what we think of as, as cloud. Um, it's search for new market growth. Um, you know, the traditional IT markets, you know, they're, they're, they're fairly mature. Um, um, you know, innovation comes at the margins. And um, reaching uh, underpenetrated and emerging markets, you know, the, the brick markets, uh, but also different kinds of customer sizes, customer types, is increasingly hard when, your primary business is uh, is is building some IP, putting it onto uh, onto a CD, and shipping it out once a year. It's hard to keep in touch with clients. It's hard to distribute uh, innovation, keep pace with innovation, and to reach new customers, which is what at the end of the day um, we all want to do. Um, 
There's also been a push from the customer side for an alignment of utilization and capacity. We all understand if we if we if we know if we have anything to do with our company's data centers, uh, we all understand that we t- typically buy for max capacity because we don't want to disappoint services that uh, you know people who are using services that may be at peak, and so we tend to overcapacitize and underutilize. And uh, so the expectations now are, you know, whether they're being met by the industry right now or not, the, the expectation for cloud is at least to move to a, a much more of a balance between um, utilization and capacity. And, and we think that more that, that uh, um, heavily, you know, sort of very granularly metered services pushes in that direction. We also see a need for new approaches, right? So, you know, the traditional IT model of two-tier distribution, um, not really adequate for, uh, uh, for, for the growth markets to, to actually push innovation out the door um, to reach new companies. Um, so, and also that the whole notion of, of, uh, of client servers being sort of a, you know, as we'll talk a little bit about, uh, being a, a, a second-gen platform in a third-gen world um, is, is becoming increasingly clear uh, because uh, the idea of adding new, uh, new capacity to a client-server architecture is, you know, is traditionally one of, of expensive scale-out. We think about disruptors that push a lot of us in, in, in a new direction. So both, again, both supply and demand, uh, particularly on the demand, but uh, because you know, as, as consumers who are, who are corporate consumers, as we call them, use use easy to use web 2.0 uh, products and their you know services in their in their daily life they show up for work and they expect to have some of the same innovation on the desktop but it's not happening uh, very fast we all know that our IT shops are are severely backlogged and uh, the requirements to to sort of deliver new capability and uh, and still keep the lights on is it is is you know it's a very daunting thing and there's a there's a pretty big schism that's been opening up in the last couple of years and so you know, if you're a vendor clearly you can you can see you know, um, Amazon, uh, you know, reaching this year over a billion dollars in, in cloud business-based cloud IT services, data services, provisioning services, storage services, uh, a, a whole host of services that they've rolled out. And really, in the last 24 months, that have gained a lot of traction. Salesforce.com uh, this year is expected to be a $2 billion business. Um, just significant um, um, new money being made that is definitely uh, causing the old incumbents of our, of our industry to, to really step up and, and take notice and realize that they've got to change the way they do things. Um, there's really a desire to simplify how IT delivers its resources. Um, when you when you think about the how the corporate IT function um, has been here before, you know, divided into separate uh, areas around you know, applications and operations and security and storage, and the notion that um, going forward we may have new IT roles that are more geared around um, um, uh, organizing, uh, sourcing, and managing external services, such that our customers, our internal constituents, the, the users who use our, our IT services. Um, are afforded a broader range of options for services, both internal and external, but they don't have to really fully know where it's coming from. They have to know only that that their IT operation is managing that sourcing and they're they're indemnifying it, standing behind it, and they'll do the break fix and and the uh, and the customer management when the time comes. So really, it's a reinvention of what corporate IT does, and we'll talk a little bit more more about that when we get into some survey data. And finally, the, the notion of some pillars. Um, really, the big pillars that everybody's talking about in the vendor community, and I think it's because it's happening in the, in the, uh, in the user community, is around cloud, social, big data, and mobile. Those are the, those are the four big clouds. We think that, that that drives the notion for a third platform that I'm going to talk about a little, in a little bit, where cloud is really the foundation um, for those other pillars uh, to, you know, to, to proliferate and to you know, drive new business value. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. If you think about it, I just want to, want to kind of underscore where we think the growth is coming from in cloud. Uh, it really is a lot of velocity there. And it's not just at the applications layer, at the, at the SaaS layer. Um, a lot of it is, is in, the, uh, in, in the platform middleware uh, orchestration layer, at the, what, what typically called PaaS, and at the infrastructure la- layer, typically called infrastructure as a service, where cloud servers, uh, virtualization as a service, storage as a service, and those kind of capabilities are networking as a service. So I just want to, want to show here a lot of companies in, in, the, in the U.S. and, and uh, worldwide use cloud uh, for, for something. And uh, in some, some many cases, uh, um, 
they don't really know where they're using it. And they, they, we think that they dramatically underestimate what they're currently doing in the cloud. And when we, when we survey, we, curr- we, 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 we pretty much know how much more to add, how many more percentage points to add to a response when a company says, we think we use one cloud service, because we help companies do audits of their, of, of their, their, their consumption of cloud services. And we just, when you just get the easy ones off the table, like WebEx and ADP for payroll, um, and maybe maybe you know Salesforce for sales automation, you know the ones that are really widely prol- proliferated, um, but also things like learning management systems, um, um, you know uh, uh, video libraries for uh, for e-learning and uh, content delivery networks, those kinds of ones that people don't even really think about very much. We think that the the use is actually quite a bit higher than people actually really believe until they do a full audit. Um, we think that this, from a spending perspective, just an order of magnitude here, SaaS spending grows by about 105% in the next three years. Um, it's pretty, pretty toward growth. Um, same, same pretty much across the board. Just sort of show the diversity of, 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 of uptake in cloud. So essentially, anything that can be, that has been bought and consumed is an is a, is a, is a IT component uh, by heretofore that's been operationalized now as a service. We, we look upon that as cloud. And um, and so really, if it, whether it's you know core infrastructure components, applications, or things like um, service management, help desk, um, all the other pieces of middleware um, that uh, um, that are being used, that sort of fits into our definition there. What well, when we ask customers why, um, they understand that it's it's uh, you know that they can grow fast within the cloud uh, if they're if they're using uh, cloud pieces. To, um, uh, to operationalize their business, to run their business, and uh, no matter what they do, um, they, can go, they can be in business faster. Um, they can, uh, um, they can, they can uh, with, with, with lower upfront capital um, cost, and, uh, and do, do what they need to do, sort of get to their core business uh, faster so they can scale faster, and, uh, and there's, we think more, more cost flex- flexibility uh, is, is still a very critical factor because customers want to understand that they're, they're, they're paying for what they use. So aligning that cost and, um, and consumption is super, super important for them. Really critically around that notion of velocity, we think that 81% um, of net, net new commercial applications, right? so companies who are just coming to market in 2012, we think that four out of five of those guys are going to be built around selling in the cloud, creating, selling, testing their application, and reaching customers via marketplace. That's huge. That's a huge number. And I guess if you think of the flip side, one in five customers, we think, in 2012 are coming to market and saying, you know what, I want to really build my business around uh, a CD, shipping a CD and uh, um, you know, a conventional distribution model and a conventional support model. That's really where I want to be at. It's, it's, hard to, it's hard to think. You know, when we talk to VCs about where they're investing, it's hard to find companies, new companies that want to invest in that model. It's, it's, not, it's not seen as, as, uh, as sustainable in competing against cloud-based companies that offer similar capabilities. So that's a pretty big, pretty big driver. We think that a lot of the, um, we think it's almost um, 30% of, uh, of, of spending in 2015 on enterprise apps will be via the cloud model. So that, that means they'll be either bought um, uh, as an electronic software download, bought online via a marketplace, and we'll talk about marketplaces in a little bit, or else they'll be SaaS applications. So that's, that's, a, that's a pretty huge number uh, because the uh, um, enterprise apps this software business in 2015, just off the top of my head, is probably about $250 billion, somewhere around there, maybe a little less than that. So it's big. But at the end of the day, really importantly to understand, uh, we still think a significant percent of the IT capability, especially in, in large companies, is going to reside on site in 2020. Um, more than 50% for more than 60% of, of companies. Now that's that's something that that is important to both um, vendors and to and to users to understand that they're going to be living in a hybrid world for a long time to come. And we think at many companies that we're never going to reach 100% of of cloud source IT capability in 2020, 2025, 2030. It just for some companies it doesn't make sense, and for some workloads it doesn't make sense. Um, at least with today's economics and and understanding that we have lots and lots of legacy uh, uh, employees, uh, um, data center space, uh, application licenses, things that we've paid for that have been operationalized and that, that are really mapped to our business and serve our business very, very well. 
So it's important to understand that that notion that for the next 10, 15 years, uh, we expect to be living in, a, in a, a very much a hybrid world. And some of the solutions that are most important to users and to vendors are ones that are hybrid and help you help help companies do things like uh, virtualization management, image management, uh, um, um, image provisioning, uh, service management, things that, that you have to do to operate in a hybrid way. So I want to talk a little bit more, a little bit more about uh, transformation of uh, of, of the cloud. So it's really a, a, a shift, as we say here, of resources and activity to the cloud. I want, to, I want to paint that picture by taking a look at the 2010 cloud share of the five critical pieces of, of cloud, and we'll go at the 2015 number. So 2010, SaaS, applications, platform as a service, so platform, middleware, database, those kinds of, of services, um, system integration um, um, is a service, server, and storage, right? Those are the those are the um, um, those are the, the the percentages as they as they fit now. So basically, nine percent for storage in twenty in twenty ten. Um, so cloud drives a ton of growth. So sixteen percent of IT of the IT market in uh, twenty fifteen is cloud. But most of the net new growth year over year for for just twenty twelve to twenty thirteen comes from cloud. Almost almost one third comes from cloud. So dramatically outsized. Um, it's uh, it's uh, it's you know the, it's the footprint of cloud in the overall IT market. The growth is there, so that means that developers, uh, vendors are are they're all skating in that direction, operationalizing their strategies for uh, you know for for reaching new customers and selling via cloud. They know that that's where the growth is. And if you take a look at the software industry as a whole, at roughly a you know it's definitely a single digit growth rate, typically between. Four and a half, and maybe eight percent, depending on on which market you're talking about. That's fairly slow growth rate. And when you're talking about thirty three percent, it's really an eye opener to companies and their boards and their funders who want their, uh, their 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 companies to be involved and 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 make more money. So when you look out at 2015, SaaS goes to 37 uh, percent. It's it's you know it's it's still a you know huge growth year over year, but as a percentage of the uh, sort of constituent of overall cloud share, it goes down. One of the reasons why it goes down is that when you when you think about where where are applications moving to be hosted from, well, um, people are migrating their packaged applications to the cloud, um, and, and we we expect to see much more of that in the future. With uh, with licensed mobility coming from um, Oracle and Microsoft and IBM and SAP and others, uh, you know, in the last couple of years, we've seen a lot more loosening around of, of, of the uh, the strictures around where you can run your software, how it's licensed, how it's audited, and uh, and we see a ton more of that moving to the cloud. So that means that as, as more and more stuff goes to SaaS, more and more packaged applications. Um, are, are, are moved to infrastructure as a service, and more and more companies who are SaaS vendors, they're also building on platform as a service. They're hosting from infrastructure as a service, from third-party infrastructure, and all of those segments, uh, you know, rise and you know rise accordingly. Um, and the same thing, of course, is very true with uh, with storage. Uh, so we really see it. You know, there's a kind of a split between new, i.e., net new, born on the web SaaS applications versus existing uh, the packaged applications that somebody's looking for someplace to host. Really drives the path and the infrastructure as a service capability. And we say about halfway down that middle bullet, public cloud paths and IaaS become the dominant customer base for components. So what does that mean? If you're a if you're a big component supplier, say you've got you sell software, say you're a Cisco or you're Microsoft. You're watching a slow transition of your key customer base from enterprise buyers to cloud service providers and SaaS providers as those companies, as their end user enterprise companies, start to say, yeah, I'm going to source more of my capability from this guy rather than, than, than spin it up in my data center. That means that, that, the, um, that these component suppliers are going to have to sell more and more to cloud service providers. So they become a much larger uh, constituency to sell to, and that, that of course means a change in a lot of things: it's selling, marketing, pricing, and a different set of competitors potentially. So it's a big deal. And then in, in, when we look to 2015, we just see a lot of diversity in the cloud customer base. Right? We see uh, it's it, it's uh, it's U.S. dominance fades. We see it hits large uh, large companies uh, in a big way, and we see it pushing out into many intelligent industries. And we'll talk about the uh, the industry cloud in a little bit. So. Cloud is really a dramatic 
refinement of the function of delivering utility service. So, you know, it could be easy to dismiss it simply as, you know, we used to run it in our data center. Now we now you run it in your data center for us. But it's really more than that. And so understanding how we get to where we are today, which is where cloud is the most substantial driver of new revenue across the, you know, $2.2 trillion IT industry, we really requires looking back at the past 40 years. So for the past 40 years, the IT industry has been sort of always built on uh, new solutions, business models, and industry structures, but really rooted to a platform or an ecosystem uh, for creating solutions and delivering them. If you look at the, you know, the first platform that really drove industry growth way back in the dinosaur days was based largely on mainframes and terminals, right? So only millions of people actually touched the technology, very sort of rarefied guys in white coats, low hundreds of packaged applications, the package apps industry was not even really invented in its current form until about 1980 by IBM. And the size of the industry, which I like to think of as the product of users and uses, was about tens of billions of dollars in revenue. So, you know, relatively small. Um, when you think about the second platform, the PC was launched in, the, in, in around 1981. Very quickly, we weren't talking about millions of users, but hundreds of millions of users who touched the stuff and used it. And literally tens of thousands of new apps built on the PC and client-server environments. And this quickly led to the IT industry to be measured in the hundreds of billions of dollars and, and exceeded the trillion dollars in, in recent years. And you see that, you know, um, it, that, that kind of growth, again, is, is sort of all organized around a platform, right? There's, there's a place for creation that sort of gets bought into. Um, uh, you know, even though this industry sort of started in 1980, it was 1986 before people had bought into the PC in a, in a, in a big way, a whole notion of a client-server architecture for, um, uh, for, for reaching those PCs. It took a while to, for that to grow. So what do we see now? Uh, we see uh, the same thing as we saw in the 80s, I would argue. We're seeing a new platform emerge. And the key ingredients are mobile devices and applications out at the edge, um, and cloud is the new core, the new delivery core, the platform. And mobile broadband, uh, 4G and beyond, is really kind of connecting those, uh, those elements to the platform. And, and two important value-generating gener overlays uh, are on top of this foundation, so big data anal analytics and social technologies. And rounding out the new platform and leveraging the new platform, um, we're seeing industry-focused solutions. In lots of industries, we're seeing um, they're using this third platform to deliver their, to their industries. So, like healthcare information exchanges, smart city uh, initiatives, transportation management clouds, and there will be hundreds of thousands, we think, of intelligent industry solutions. And so, this new platform will reach billions of users. Uh, in fact, we're, we're already on our way with around 2 billion people already correct, connected to the Internet, about half through mobile devices, so, and uh, trillions of smart devices. Uh, two billion connect. That, that, that's, that's really just a huge uh, l growth in the number of nodes connected to this platform um, than even in the last five years. Um, and new, new millions of new applications and services. Um, it, I think this last month we hit over a million um, applications available for Apple and Android voice devices combined uh, today. So it's it's pretty tremendous growth, and it's going to drive really the next two billion dollars in growth in our industry. So the last twenty five years was about. Um, Smart Cloud to develop a second platform, and, and really this is the platform for growth in the next 25 years. Um, we see mobile path platforms uh, enable the new applications, and uh, you know what's the value for developers and for users? Unlimited hardware resources, uh, you can reach potentially an infinite number of users and, via marketplaces. It really increasingly, the key message here is that we think a third platform is where applications will live. So whether they're, whether you, customers migrate them there to infrastructure, whether they build them using platform as a service, or whether they leverage SaaS applications, we think this is where a tremendous amount of the application's capability is going to be living and uh, where the innovation and growth is going to come from. So it's a pretty, pretty big factor, I would say. So I want to share some survey data with you. Um, when we ask companies, what, you know, what's your likelihood to, to adopt cloud services for? We always want to sort of understand what do you want to put in the private cloud, which we'll talk about in a little bit, just kind of a, 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 a sort of a new way of looking at how you deploy things locally, uh, how you, how you um, build uh, your, um, you know, your service allocation and how you manage your infrastructure for your internal users on your own site, and what you, what you really want to put in the public cloud you think is either steady state uh, that you run uh, and, and, and you don't want to run anymore, maybe it's expensive to run or your, some of your products are becoming end of life or there's new capability you want to reach. This is something that some of the distinctions we see. And 
I talked about the four pillars before. You know, cloud obviously is 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 sort of what the survey was about. But if we map big data and social and mobile to it, you'll see that some of the biggest public cloud drivers from workload cap, uh, standpoint really come from those uh, from those pillars. We also asked companies about to try to get to try to gauge where they were in their life cycle of adopting cloud public cloud services. And many, indeed, most companies we talked to, um, you know, really from from the very small to the very large, are, have have thought through. Um, here's our here's either we have to think through, or they have thought through, or they're getting help in thinking through. Here's our three to five year plan for sourcing new capability, for replacing what we have now, for end of life and what we have now, and for incorporating cloud, public cloud, into our sourcing uh, uh, plans and, uh, and, or, and or for reoperationalizing uh, how we do things locally using private cloud. Those are, those are all pretty, uh, they're pretty far along, along the way in doing that. So if you think about, take a look at this, the many, many organizations are using SaaS right now. Again, I typically add about, about uh, 7 to 10 percentage points to some of these responses because we don't think the companies really understand very fully um, where they're using and what they're using and why they're using it and, and where it comes from. But this is a, this is a verbatim uh, data stated on a recent survey from the summer. Uh, and you see that the number of companies who are using two-plus cloud services, and, and of course there, there are a whole pass of companies that, re- that report, that understand what they do very well as a company and report using five, six, seven, eight cloud services. And when we ask them where, where does this come from, where do, you, where do you procure your cloud services, a big chunk of it, of course, comes from large ISVs. And, and you know, I think that number would be a lot higher if those large ISVs had actually gotten to the game earlier and were selling more of their portfolio um, via the cloud. Microsoft, of course, is, has, uh, is, is in the last year or so has stated that, that you know, their goal is to sell pretty much everything that they sell in the package world via the cloud uh, with uh, peer capability, so essentially the same capability uh, in, the, in the cloud. So they're not there yet, but just sort of judging by, um, by where they're moving, and we see IBM moving in the same direction. Of course, I mean, everybody, you know, I think Oracle is, is, is moving quickly in that direction. Um, lots of uh, you know, key, key vendors in the software industry are quickly moving in that direction. I would certainly put progress software in that, in that same, same bucket. Um, and a lot of companies also are saying at the end of the day, you know what, we, we, uh, we're going to go through our, our a, a specialist uh, aggregator or VAR, which I tend to think of as being a marketplace operator. So um, we're going to talk a little more, more about marketplaces, but you know, companies whose job it is to pull together SaaS solutions and um, and package them for certain kinds of customer types, small business, etc. So how concerned are you about cloud? This is another key factor. You know, security always kind of tops out tops out the list. Um, it's 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 pretty big here. Security tends to be a a, a holding ground for things like. Governance, data leakage, um, um, uh, you know, uptime, etc. So it's kind of it's kind of specious to just ask about security, but we tend to think that that's always high because some of those things are combined. Costs are still a big deal. People are concerned about cloud cost, cloud costs because one of the reasons why they've understood how to run what they run, what they need to run, pretty well um, in their in their operation, and they're not always sure. They're not good examples out there for cost comparisons between you know with similar capability and the exactly similar. Uh, you know, users getting exactly what they need, uh, what they're getting right now from the packaged application versus the cloud application. So cost, I think it's more of a, it's a worry. They want to have it demonstrated to them. Um, when you think about, the, you know, performance, is, it gonna, is, is, is there going to be latency? Is there going to be, um, is the uptime going to be as good as it is when it's delivered by my IT department? Uh, another big concern um, availability. It, that, that's, I guess that speaks to the uptime issue. Um, uh, you know, these guys are you know, the data centers, cloud data centers, where where uh, where cloud applications and services are hosted are huge power hawks. You know, is, is that is, is is that impact on availability? We've seen a couple incidences in the last uh, in the last six months alone, uh, where you know the, the huge number of data centers in in uh, Northern Virginia, uh, a whole swath of them went down for a matter of hours. That's that's millions of dollars to businesses that depend on them. So. Understanding availability and um, and the SLA and, and and how that's remediated for the comp- for the user companies is pretty big. Um, lock in customers don't want to be locked in. Uh, they want to they want to be able to take a, a workload or some some IP that they've built and worked on. Maybe it's a data set and they want to be able to lift it cleanly and move it someplace else if they want to. So they want to have choice, and that's I think still a TBD 
agenda item for many cloud providers. Um, they they're sort of not there yet because they're they're just not there yet. So, but I think it's a it's a very valid concern for from um, from the buy side. Um, Revenue compliance. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's you know it, it seems like it's low here, uh, but it, it it shouldn't be so low. I mean, we think about our when we surveyed for this in Europe. I mean, there's uh, there are obviously different regulations. Um, the EU has got their proposed European Data Protection Regulation, uh, and it, it really it really points to the need for cloud service providers to uh, to make um, uh, to make um, compliance a real key design point in their cloud architectures, and they haven't really done so yet, and not being pushed to do so so, so much in the United States. So that's got to come. And finally, at the end of the day, we talked a little bit before about skills and org structure. People say they're not worried about that, but we think that that might actually potentially be a it, they will change. There's no doubt that they will change uh, in, in the next 10 years um, around uh, you know, new job types like, um, like cloud service management and data management. Um, those are going to become more important jobs than they are today, uh, and they're going to be driven by cloud. So really briefly, I want to go over some different deployment models. Um, just you know, on, the far, on the far left, you've got tradi- two traditional models. You've got I do it myself. Or else I outsource it to you. I do IT outsourcing, or I do um, uh, you know hosted application management. On the right, we've got sort of the the, the spectrum of of of, uh, of options in the cloud. So we've got self-run private cloud. I run it on my site. Manage private cloud. This is it's on my site. I, the equipment's on my site. I pay for it. Um, uh, but however, I've, I'm going to hire an external provider. Um, to to run run it remotely, so do all kinds of uh, telemetry, lifecycle kinds of things, keep app, apps up and running, um, and uh, and you know make sure that my network services work the way they should. So that's kind of that's a model that's been around for a long time, but new to this world is ma- is, is managing private clouds. Then in the cloud, so think think of the firewall there between managed private cloud and dedicated private cloud. We've got we've got stuff that runs. At a provider site, at a host site, right? So dedicated private cloud, it's just you know it, it, the resource allocation is one to one, not one to many. It's very dedicated on the customer a workload, um, and uh, a lot of lot of handholding, more like traditional outsourcing, but it's operationalized as a as a cloud, meaning that it it's you know it's customer self service. There's fairly granular billing. It's not necessarily based on a long term contract, but based on consumption, etc. And then we get to the far right, we get the public cloud, and a little carve out there called virtual private cloud. Virtual cl- private cloud is typically a landing area for many co- customers. Uh, I know the Amazon sites that 70% of the customers who come and use AWS or AC2 start out in their VPC kind of holding pen. There's, uh, there's uh, a VPN capability. There's more granular control and security for customer applications, but it costs more. And so customers want to eventually be able to understand that they can, they can move to public cloud kinds of services. So these, just in a nutshell, these are the kinds of services that we think are out there. When we asked customers recently, what do you spend, where are you, where are you spending your dollars now versus where do you spend it, do you think you're going to spend it in two years? We see a pretty dramatic shift, right? We see the traditional stuff goes down slightly, right? And, and the cloud-based deployment models goes up commensurately. Um, a little, the traditional on-premise IT going down 11 points, it's a little bit, a little bit specious because that essentially is uh, dollars moving to, some of it is dollars moving to the public cloud and some of it is dollars moving to self-run private cloud. Yet we're still going to run it on site. We're still going to run it the way we always have. Uh, it's not really, um, it's not really uh, transformative. We're just going to do it in a different way. But, but you know, we're going to, we're going to still be uh, responsible for the stuff, buying the stuff, amortizing it, running it, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but what we really think is the carve-out of, uh, of public clouds where most of those resources are going to go to. So why? You think about why customers are making that transition. There are some obvious reasons why they see it's a lot of, it's a value for us to move some of our capability and our dollars and, and, and into the public cloud and to uh, think about SaaS. And there are some key benefits. I think we've heard a lot of these ones. I just want to highlight some key points on some of these. One, that, you know, that essentially there's an all infrastructure and maintenance. So you're not paying an upfront capital cost for a set of licenses. And then the, the equipment uh, middleware OS license is required to uh, to stand up that service, and then the people required to run it and manage it. It's really an all-in cost for infrastructure and, and maintenance. So integration is simpler because you're not supporting several platforms and multiple versions of the same app. That's, that's a pretty big deal. 
um, API-based integration. Integration is hard. So uh, enterprise application integration, data integration, process integration, those are all very hard to do. And the hope is that is that um, uh, by uh, by moving to a um, to a, a sort of a, a centerpiece cloud application, I think that an example that, that people talk about a lot is Salesforce.com, um, you know, the sales center or service center uh, cloud um, uh, applications. By moving to that model and then either buying other applications that are built. Um, on that standardized model for uh, for access, uh, for the standard data tiers and standard business logic, um, you you can benefit from removing a lot of the a lot of the obligation to do integration. Same thing is true at the data level and at the process level. And when you build applications on a platform that's that's you know, co-resident from those applications, you're going to you're going to gain those same benefits. So customers feel pretty good about the integration there based on APIs. Um, lower capital costs. We talked about that a little bit. Um, just lower costs for across the board, lower license costs and infrastructure costs. Um, easier, easier upgrades, which I think is really key. It's, uh, this is a headache for IT. Um, and when the service provider manages the uh, SaaS provider, it, it's essentially a service provider, um, manages patches and upgrades, no CDs to ship out uh, to your business units, to your, um, um, to your, you know, the companies that are, that, are, that are underneath your company, um, even other users, um, and that's really important. So budgeting becomes more consistent, right, because you pretty much know what you're going to spend within certain, certain limits, and then there are no version control issues within the stack. So when you get a new version of something, a new edition of something that contains a lot of innovation that your your users want to get access to, you often have to think about, well, this only runs on the latest operating system or, or 64-bit or 32-bit or, or, or whatever it is or on the open source stack. It doesn't make any difference with, with, with cloud. Um, you may have... You may have fewer choices, but they're all going to, there's going to be no version control uh, uh, problems there and no need to upgrade to the latest version of something else to get capability you want from the application. And user adoption, um, it's, 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 it's really a lot easier to push innovation out to users and to, to get and measure their adoption. So that's, that, that's obviously going to provide better productivity at the end of the day, more, more bang for the dollar spent by IT, and more value for the company. So a phase plan for success, I'll take you through this really quickly. These are some things that we have advise customers to think about a lot. Is this a net new or replacement application uh, uh, for you? Do, you know, how well do you understand your, your stack topology and all the dependencies? You know, does this application, as we're using it right now, does it link into, for example, uh, data, uh, other data services, or um, um, things like uh, Active Directory uh, or uh, other pieces that you you need to think about when you're making a move, uh, maybe moving to a, to a to a SaaS service. Um, is it you know what are the user needs? What do users really need at the end of the day? What kind of new capability do they need? What are the business requirements? Um, it, I mean, is it is it is is it are you, are you buying something or, or building something to help your internal users? Do something faster, sell faster, uh, create products better, do, uh, do product distribution better, do logistics better. Uh, what are the business requirements that are really driving this need? And then is it part of an ad hoc or a long-term plan? Do you need it like tomorrow, or can it be part of your three- to five-year plan? We next advise customers to move to a technical design stage and really understand that, you know, the target deployment platform and think about maybe customizations that you've written for this particular application that you're using and what's going to happen to those. Does that capability reside elsewhere, or are you going to have to change some of your, um, you know, some of your business practices, some of, your, some of the way you do business, uh, some of your workflow to map to the new capability? Uh, prepare to move, uh, essentially just, you know, you know, prepare the user audience, get them on, to understand what's going to go on. Really important to find a, a set of champions in the line of business to sort of get everybody excited. We all kind of know what those people are in our businesses, and they're, you know, they're, they're really important um, because, frankly, some people don't always read the emails from their IT department, and uh, it's got to it's gotta, it's gotta be top-down buy-in to, um, uh, to this transition and a set of champions uh, people, who people can turn to for support and for encouragement. Um, finding the migration stage, there's a lot of testing that goes on, a lot of refining of plans, a lot of iteration, and it's got to be a business process success because at the end of the day, it's getting new business value from the IT service that, that's going to drive, that drives the purchase and drives all the work there. So it's got to it's got to be viewed as a business process success, not an IT success. They happen to have the budget, and that's that's usually the way that works very well in companies. And then finally, at the end of the day, operate and optimize. Get into an uh, operational mode, um, set up a, a service desk process, um, uh, really iterate um, and, and figure out, do we need to map our business processes to how 
this application does something or vice versa? Can we, can we modify it? Can we, can we configure it in a way that works for us? Uh, and just explore that a bit more. And finally, always continually assess uh, utilization. Um, that's the very key. And we, we, we all know from the package software world, the term shelfware, um, the, the shelfware is not unknown in the SaaS world, uh, but it's much easier to automate services now to send out reminder emails. Have you done this? Or to in, instantiate that a new process must be done on this platform, this new SaaS platform. That's much easier than... Um, than in the package world because not everybody's got the same version or the same software at the same time. In this way, they, they always do. So it, it's easy to push that. So those are some key, key points for success. I talked before about the marketplace as a place for selling, and I just want to underscore how important we think this is going to be, how, how much it's going to change. It's really the future of software distribution. If you see the quote down there in the lower right, we think by 2014, really almost one in five new business software purchases are going to be made through a marketplace run by an ISV or a third-party operator. We're going to see the growth of third-party marketplace operators even more than there are now, whose sole business is not really developing code. They don't really have a skin in the game there. They just want to be a place to sell, and they understand selling and the, the life cycle support very well. So some of the reasons here are the reasons why you can, you can you know, build, build stuff very quickly, test it, and, uh, and, and you can reach a set of providers. And uh, that you, so you as a, as a user audience, um, you, can, you can source new capability very quickly and, and you know where to find it, know where it's supported, know what kind of ecosystem it's part of. You know, is it part of the Azure marketplace or Salesforce marketplace or the Google marketplace, et cetera, well, whatever the marketplace is, um, and, uh, and, and go there and know that's going to be supported. And then you can provide, uh, provide and, and, and use lifecycle services there um, because they're all organized around that same ecosystem, so support, patches, training, et cetera. Um, so it really it's easier for your users to access and configure. You can point them to, the, to that, and that becomes the – you know, we, we're, there's a lot of talk about the enterprise, the enterprise app store inside the firewall where IT organizations that are setting up private clouds are building services lists that their internal constituencies can use and say, well, I want to have this service. Say maybe it's a, you know, it's a, it's a faster storage service, whatever it is. And, um, I, but I, and we're willing to pay this much more for it uh, than, than for the standard service because we, we need it and we have the money for it. That kind of enter, in, internal enterprise app cloud uh, we think is is happening in the in, in the public world in a big way, and is going to be more and more of a place for um, not only for IT professionals but for bit, line of business professionals to source new capability. So, what to think about when you make the move? This is sort of a um, sort of a what should I do slide. Key things to think about: you're making a commitment to a whole ecosystem at the end of the day, right? So, um, who do you buy from? Do you buy from your existing apps vendor, right? Your company that you get most of your capability from, whether it's you know, whoever it is, I don't want to name any names, but you know who the incumbents are, or a pure play provider. Are there, are there benefits or differences from doing one or the other? You know, if you think about your traditional very large software vendor that sells you stuff, the incumbent, you know, they're, they're making the move. Uh, and, and they, but if you go to them and knock on the door and say, I want to buy a, I want to buy a cloud-based solution, um, you might get, well, it's coming. It's definitely coming, and, and you know, stay with us for a bit longer. And you might get, you know, you might get a very res- responsive answer. Um, so it really, a lot of factors are in, are in play there. You have to really explore what do you want to do and, uh, and where do you get the most capability from and how much pain is it to move off of what you have now. Um, do they provide, it's, essentially it's a, a managed services contract. So thinking about the contract you have with these guys, um, what does the SLA mean to you? Does it indemnify you if you lose business? So there's downtime, uh, or is there is there um, service credit uh, for that? Essentially, you get you get some free days. Um, so, what does that mean to you? How does it fit in your business model? Functionally, does it give you what you need uh, for, as, a, as a business organization, or is there just not enough capability out there? If you're a big user of uh, say Oracle Transportation Management and 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 you know you know Logos uh, cloud service, they, Logos does a cloud uh, you know truck tracking and and warehouse management services, do they provide the same capability? If they don't, is it okay? Can you map your business processes to somebody else's new application? Because maybe maybe it's a more modern application. So not necessarily a bad thing, but you've got to figure out what you want to do about that. Um, Know why you're doing what you're doing at the end of the day. What, What are your IT goals? Is it saving money? Is it is it being able to repurpose some of your staff into different roles? Is it, is it you know, you've done a software audit and a lot of your software is close to uh, end of life and you want to figure out a way to get around that? So what are your goals there? And then what are the KPIs 
um, the key performance indicators to measure and then reevaluate and always push for more optimization. If you know you sign a contract with somebody, you know the, the typical is great contract sign. You know, good luck. We'll talk to you in a year. These guys uh, continually win your loyalty. Uh, thinking about your provider is, is is super key. So I've got a couple a couple notes there about about you know why that's important. Obviously, um, making a push button experience for your users is just is so critical because um, you're, it's, it's a lot of money and and utilization you know key utilization is uh, is is super super important. And you want to be able to have them work with you so that you can you can always optimize and ask for more more more. So the good news is at the end of the day, once you've done all the hard work of moving. You, you, you will have, you should have, if you've done your homework, really a secure, efficient, agile, repeatable, scalable template. Um, so it's, it's pretty, really important. So um, I think that that's uh, all I've got. I know Mike's got some questions. So Yeah, yeah. I mean, first of all, that was a great presentation. Right? I think there's a bunch of really great information in there. I mean, certainly from, from my perspective, the whole concept of the third platform and, you know, the rise of PaaS um, to become like the the dominant model is obviously great news for, for progress given our, our recent announcement about our strategic direction. Um, yeah, we, we had a, a, f a few questions uh, come in, so uh, I'll go through some of these. Uh, the first one uh, pertains to the data around security. Um, you talked about the fact that security uh, is probably the number one concern that people raise. Uh, and the question really comes down to, is this perception or reality? I think it's re I think it's reality, Mike. It, just in brief, I think a lot of customers don't when they talk about security. When they think about security, I think it's a very broad template, and everybody's got their own personal agenda. Whether it's whether it's data protection, uh, whether it's reliability, whether it's uh, data breach, um, uh, or, or you know whatever it is. It, is there is there data? Is there IP? So whether it's a process they built or some customer data, is it safe? And I think it is viable. We we you know, I, I think I think it's a little bit. Um, I think it's a little bit overestimated because companies uh, maybe don't realize how exposed they they already are to uh, to, to to the cloud and to data data leakage. Their their, their users are using uh, public cloud and uh, consumer collaboration all the time. They're trading files on cell phone networks uh, and they're using uh, financial networks that have been built uh, using the public internet uh, for the last twenty years. And so we're already pretty much pretty much there. Um, you know, it's, I, I always quote, it's the old uh, Palmala commercial, we're already soaking in it, uh, <laughs> for those who are old enough to understand that. And so I think understanding that and understanding what, what are the best practices that you can do to find a provider who's got whatever it is that you need, so whether it's, you know, hard and physical security, whether it's, you know, a, a two-tier power supply, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, or else it's, uh, the other end of it's just tremendous, a tremendous SLA with identification that works for you and your company, understanding that is, is, is super critical. And we mentioned the, uh, um, uh, the Euro European data protection regulations right now, and that in the U.S. we don't have anything quite like that. We have some industry-by-industry industry, uh, regulation that it can be quite stringent. But companies in those industries are really built up with the notion that if they don't, if they don't bring the level of security uh, that to, to the table, it's, it's really table stakes for them to even be able to bid on government contracts or to bid on on contracts in the financial services industry or uh, or in the, in the manufacturing world. It's really table stakes. And so I think we really get it here from an industry focus here, uh, at, but where we haven't been pushed so much in the general purpose world as fast as they have in Europe, I think. Yeah, and, and, and I guess part of the point as well is this comes down to uh, checking out your vendor, yeah? making sure that they do have either whether it's ISO 20 South, 27001 or SAS 70 or whatever kind of compliance ultimately you need to run your applications. Yeah. I think I think that's very fair, Mike. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you touched on Europe a little bit there as, as part of that discussion. As, and that one of the other questions that's come in is, uh, is this a global trend? I mean, you know, there seems to be the fact that probably North America is probably ahead of the curve slightly compared to the, the rest of the world. But, you know, this is definitely a global trend, yeah? It is. It is I mean, it, without a doubt. I mean, IDC maps uh, cloud out to uh, eight worldwide regions, and you know, without a doubt, the uh, the United States, and particularly the, the Western United States, is, the, is without a doubt the most mature uh, user of, of of cloud. But it's you know, we, we see we see tons of cloud growth in uh, Japan, 
and uh, and I would say Japan and Western Europe as being the two other outside of North U.S. regions that are growing the fastest. Probably the slowest growth comes out of Latin America, uh, but still substantial growth. And, and it's it's those net new companies that have said, you know what, it's easy for me to be very small, be a startup, and look bigger than I am by uh, by using cloud infrastructure and selling on a cloud marketplace. Uh, I can I can accomplish it that way, and many other large large providers uh, um, saying that you know we we understand that some set of our customers are going to be want to serve via these kinds of services, and so we better operationalize them and, and build them for them. So I think slower transition in and outside of North America. Yeah, cool. Um, and I see we're coming close to the hour, so I've probably just got time for one more question. Um, again. W- in the data there, you had the trends in terms of the types of workloads that people, you know, are, are predominantly looking to move, um, and there's there's things like email and stuff at the top of those. So the the question comes down to um, how many real transactional type applications are, are people really moving to to cloud, and and whether that's public or private. Are we, are we seeing a, a big shift, uh, or or is it people just kind of putting their toes in the water and trying things like cloud and, and maybe, uh, sorry, email, the things that maybe they don't feel are a true line of business, you know, uh, financial uh, implication type uh, applications. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question because it really is, that is that is the sort of the barometer for how, or how serious this is. And I, and I would say that when you think about Transactional applications, um, um, they're, they're by nature re- real time, not, not so much batch. They're, they're, they're critical. They have to tie into, uh, other applications, so front ends that can, you know, that create, uh, events that, that, that are transacted upon them, whether it's in an e-commerce platform or some other kind of, you know, uh, event automation infrastructure. Um, so I, I would say that in general, we're seeing more acceptance uh, uh, from for, for cloud for transactional applications, and I would I, I point I just point to one that I think is 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 really important because um, because it's just kind of it's one that I, I do a lot of work in, and I, I know that it requires a lot of of uptime and speed, and that is um, uh, cont, cont, uh, the B2C contact center. Uh, stuff. So, so you know, we all know that, that Salesforce.com is deep into customer relationship management, but never really have made much of much headway in selling stuff to uh, con- consumer products companies that have to, you know, and and maybe financial services firms that have to serve customers, and they have to always be up. And we're being down for a matter of seconds uh, can be can be a huge deal to them. Um, we're seeing more and more of those guys um, who you know place an exact dollar value value on. Uh, on seconds down, um, deciding to, to that the cloud is, is 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 fast enough for them that there's enough um, traction, transactional value that maybe enough of their data is already in the cloud. So access to the data uh, based on a web call or an API is uh, is that much faster because that's sort of co-located with their data. For whatever reason, they're moving more of the sourcing more of the capability, real time transactional capability in the cloud. So I don't think we're we're fully there yet, Mike. But I think that as more and more customers are touching. The the application via the cloud. More and more, of the data is in the cloud. The transactional capability also should be in the cloud. Great. Um, well, as I say, we're pretty much uh, on the hour. So, uh, firstly, I'd like to thank Robert. Uh, great presentation. I say I think there's a huge amount of uh, valid data in there that people can uh, peruse and look at later uh, once the recording is available. I'd like to thank everybody who attended today. Hopefully, uh, you found it a, a useful webinar. Uh, And with that, I'd like to say uh, thank you, uh, goodbye, and that concludes the webinar for today. Thanks, all.